On September 11th, 2013 in Colorado, a massive storm system from the south got trapped by a low pressure system and started to dump rain all across the Front Range. Uh, and as you can see, led to flash flood conditions. Yeah, more than 17 inches of rain fell in one week uh, here in Boulder, and the Boulder Creek rose to dangerous levels, uh, flowing more than 5,000 cubic feet per second, the highest seen since uh, May of 1894. Damage was widespread, taking buildings off of their foundation, uh, washing out roads, and flooding entire neighborhoods. In the city of Lyons, people were trapped by ri rising floodwaters for three days straight, uh, and some people in the mountains saw their entire community washed away. It was declared a 1,000-year rain event, uh, and the effects are still being felt today. On my own street, we experienced uh, flash flooding for two days straight. Uh, due to some irrigation canals uh, overflowing. Now this looks a lot quieter and calmer than the images I just showed you, but water is insidious. We still have two families that haven't been able to return to their homes uh, due to the damage that this quiet stream of water inflicted. Here you can see some of the work we did over the course of a day to try to divert water away from our neighbor's uh, living area. And all we really could do was route the water through their garage. There was nothing we could do to stop it. In these events, the urge to help is overpowering. I spent three days helping my neighbors deal with the relentless water, and of course, emergency responders uh, and volunteers descended from all over to help the people deal with the damage. However, increasingly, we're starting to see people that are not local to an event want to help online. And they're getting increasingly effective at the types of aid they can provide online. And sometimes you see a collaboration occur between the uh, people who are local at an event and people who are trying to help from afar. And they, both groups are turning more and more to uh, the same device that you also have, a smartphone and social media. And that is where you come in, because as I hope to show you, you can make a difference in these events using your smartphones and social media. Indeed, that's where we come in. Because while the Colorado event, it wasn't on the same scale as a Hurricane Sandy, as I stood there on my overflowing street, it was like watching the research that I do flow right on by. I'm part of a research project at University of Colorado called Project EPIC, which stands for Empowering the Public with Information in Crisis. We have a team of information scientists, social scientists, and computer scientists collaborating to uh, understand how people use their smartphones uh, and social media during times of mass emergency. Indeed, this behavior is starting to transform how uh, emergency response uh, occurs in these events. Uh, and uh, what's causing this transformation? Well, this picture provides some insight. In 2005, people were waiting for, uh, to hear who the new pope was going to be. And so they gathered in this plaza uh, to wait. And you can see, uh, if you look at the bottom uh, right uh, of the, of the um, image there, that there's just one cell phone visible uh, in this crowd. Well, last year they announced another pope, so people again converged on this plaza to wait for the announcement. And this is what it looked like. <laughs> and you can see that in eight years' time, our society is completely transformed. We have a deep integration of technology uh, into people's daily lives like we've never seen before. And now with access to this technology, people can access information during an event and can post information about an event in ways uh, that ha haven't been possible before. Uh, now, and this is challenging the, the way we view emergency response. So the traditional view of emer emergency management involves thinking of a disaster event and the, cra uh, the uh, disaster event and members of the public as somewhat separate entities. And the formal response will show up and erect a sort of information interface between the two. Uh, and while members of the public will communicate directly with the formal response, this model really views uh, the public information officers, the PIOs, as the main source of information for the mainstream media, who will then deliver that information to members of the public. But in reality, this separation is artificial. Members of the public are standing there minding their own business when an event happens right on top of them. 
Indeed, disaster sociology refers to members of the public as the true first responders, the people who will uh, organize to take people in their cars to hospitals, uh, to pull people out of the rubble and the like. But now with these cell phones and our, our, our pervasive access to technology, these people will instead turn to social media and they'll start to report on what they're seeing. They'll post pictures of damage. They'll start making requests for help. And even more importantly, the people who are not local to the event will, through social media, respond. And they will uh, post the information far and wide. They'll comment on it. They will send their support. They will start to organize to try to, try to help. The mainstream media, of course, still plays a role, as does the formal response and their public information officer. And what really happens is that a huge conversation occurs between this group. And there's a, there's a large information, a large churn of information around the event as people try to make sense of it and start to collectively respond to the event. And it's that information space that Project Epic studies. And we call it crisis informatics, the study of how pervasive access to technology is changing the way the world responds to mass emergency events. And my role in Project Epic is to write the software services that are used to collect data, like the geolocated tweets that you see here. This image shows the tweets that we collected that were, that were geotagged um, within the first 24 hours of the 2011 Japan earthquake and tsunami. And what my colleagues will do, uh, my information science and social science colleagues will do, is look at those tweets and try to understand what are people saying, what information is being shared, is anyone listening, is anyone responding, and are groups working together to try to improve things uh, over the course of the event. And we've seen this transformation now occur for about 10 years. So in 2005, we got a glimpse of what was to come uh, when, after the London subway bombings, people uh, who were on the, the, the subway posted uh, pictures of the aftermath uh, to social media sites after the event. And in 2007, uh, after the Virginia Tech shootings, students flocked to Facebook and created pages about the event and started to engage in I'm OK, are you OK type conversations. And across six to eight of these pages over the course of a day or two, these pages had identified all of the victims and the shooter before the official release of that information. Also in 2007, we saw in the Southern California wildfires in San Diego, uh, people use Twitter to keep up to date on the, uh, on the event, use hashtags to make it easy to find information about the event, and we also saw people take their smartphones and go behind the fire lines and take pictures of people's homes to show people which homes were still standing and which had burned to the ground. In, and then in, in Hurricane Sandy in 2012, we started to see the first instances of members of the public and members of the formal response communicating directly with each other through Twitter, through social media, because the 911 system was overwhelmed and it was the only way in which people could get requests for help to the dispatchers. And almost in silent acknowledgement of how important our smartphones are, we also saw charging stations spring up all across New York City. People who had power shared it with people who didn't. These phones become critical digital lifelines during these events, the only way that sometimes people can get access to information or make a request for help. And indeed, we saw these uh, charging stations turn into community centers where people gathered uh, to offer each other support, get charged up, uh, get up to date on information as well. But it's important to realize that it's not just an individual phenomenon of people getting information and reporting information but that what's more interesting is that people are using these technologies to group together and make the response more effective. And nowhere was that more evident than in the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. So on January 12, 2010, Haiti was hit by a 7.0 magnitude earthquake. It killed an estimated 150,000 people and destroyed over 280,000 buildings. Essential infrastructure, things like communication, uh, hospitals, uh, shipping, all wiped out. In uh, Port-au-Prince, it was a scene of utter devastation, uh, but it generated a massive humanitarian response and uh, provided an interesting set of group behaviors to study. Indeed, hundreds of people converged on the event uh, and engaged in very interesting behaviors. So for instance, one group on Twitter started to identify who was local to the event, posting information from Port-au-Prince using satellite phones. And then that group started to organize donation drives to keep those phones online. And a very interesting thing happened with respect to maps. 
OpenStreetMap is a website where you can go to get freely available map data submitted by anyone. Uh, and you can also upload uh, changes to that map data, make it more uh, accurate. You can think of it as Wikipedia meets Google Maps. Now, on the day of the earthquake, the open street map of Port-au-Prince looked like this. It had a few major roads and a few secondary roads, but that was about it. And a call for help was issued to the open street map community, saying, we have satellite and aerial images of the city, and we need people to trace the streets and buildings that are on these images and upload them into OpenStreetMap. Uh, and over 600 people responded and do uh, donated their time and volunteered their time in order to do that. And three weeks later, the OpenStreetMap of Port-au-Prince looked like this. Uh, a highly detailed map of the city that could be freely accessed by all the emergency response organizations that were converging on the event physically. And this led to the creation of the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, a group, an, an incorporated nonprofit that does this to this day. Uh, indeed, we now see mass emergency as a catalyst for human innovation around technology and disaster response. And my colleagues uh, saw multiple groups either get their start, such as Humanity Road, uh, or participate, such as U Ushahidi, in this event and help in very significant ways. And by studying these events, my colleagues routinely find these behaviors and reflect on what they mean for society. But before they can do that, they need one thing, data, and lots of it. And that's where I come in. My students and I implement the software services that can collect large amounts of data during these events. And we face two challenges when we do that. The first is that a lot of the data is transient, especially Twitter data. Uh, it can be gone in a couple of hours, such that you can't access it again. So you need to be collecting while the event unfolds. And there's also a challenge of high volume. We've seen events generate 100 tweets per second, uh, which translates to about 8.6 million tweets per day. And it's not easy to write software that can operate 24-7, collecting that amount of data, and not crash or lose the data in some way. So these challenges in turn force uh, my students and I to adopt techniques that are still unfamiliar for many software developers. Gone are the days where we can rely on a single machine processing uh, data set sequentially to find the information we need. Instead, we have to make use of many machines and maximize the use of concurrency. So as much as Project Epic would love to be in a simple situation where we have one machine connected to Twitter and one machine working to act as the database, it just won't work. If a bug takes out either of those machines, uh, we will lose data. And our, we can't afford to lose data. In order to do the research that we do, we need comprehensive, complete data sets. We need to be able to reliably and robustly collect that data 24-7. Furthermore, there's just too much data. So a single event can generate thousands of gigabytes of data. And so we couldn't store it on a single machine, even if we wanted to. Instead, we use multiple machines for collection and storage. We currently have six uh, machines in our cluster, and we have a storage uh, capacity of 20 terabytes. Uh, and we make use of technology, things like Hadoop and Cassandra, that make it easy for us to increase our storage and our computational power simply by adding more machines. Uh, when Twitter finds a tweet for us, they'll send it to us, and we'll take a look at it. And if we decide that we want it, we'll put it in the database. And then what Cassandra will do for us is it will automatically make sure that that piece of data gets copied to some other machine. And that way, if one of these machines goes down, we haven't lost any data. The copies exist on the other machines. And that gives us the time to go in and repair that machine or stand up another machine and add it into the cluster so that we're constantly able to collect and store this data. And eventually, our cluster will fill up with uh, tweets. And this then puts us into a great uh, position to analyze this data all at once. And this is where concurrency comes in. Now that we have these tweets distributed in this way, we can analyze them. So let's say we're interested in the percentage breakdown of languages across the data set. We can use a technique called MapReduce to answer that question. So in the map phase, a program on uh, each of these machines will look at each tweet and map it to the particular language that it was uh, generated in. And then in the reduce phase, each machine counts up those tweets so that it knows the instances that it's seen on its, on its particular node. And then we reduce again so that we add up all the way across all the machines and we get the final totals. And then we can visualize that information and start to gain insight into it. And that's where things get interesting and useful. Because then we can do things like plot the 70,000 geolocated tweets that were produced before the landfall of Hurricane Sandy 
and then engage in research with our partners at the uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research uh, to understand if people are using social media to decide if they're going to evacuate or not. Or we could plot the uh, Twitter activity around the Colorado floods event uh, and see that you know, on that first day we had about 51 tweets per minute. And what are, the, what are people saying and sharing on that first day? And what are the software services they need to be more effective that day? And then nine days later, when we're down at three tweets per minute, uh, how has the conversation shifted as we've moved from response to recovery? And what types of, social serv uh, what types of uh, software services would people need then? And so we, uh, we look at that type of issue, and we're starting to design software that will help in all of these phases. In addition, we can do things like generate a report of all tweets that pointed at pictures during an event, and in, in the case of the Colorado floods event, share these with civil engineers who are doing systematic reconnaissance of the damage caused by the flood, and watch as they discover damage that they didn't see initially and plan to go back to do more reconnaissance and understand the impact of that damage, and then see them have the light bulbs go over their heads as they realize that social media could be deeply integrated into the, the, the work that they do in the future. And Project Epic is, is engaged in exactly this type of research, and our goal is to understand how people are using these tools that they have today in order to design uh, software that makes them more effective in the future. And that takes me back to standing on my street uh, during the Colorado floods. While I was happy to help my neighbors in their time of need, at the same time, the software I helped design was collecting data that is being used now to improve our response the next time around. And that has an important lesson for you and me. Together, we are powerful. With our current technology, we have powerful new ways of helping each other. Because what if the photo of a downed power line that you take uh, can be routed to a utility company seconds after it's posted? What if the video of damage caused by a flash flood that you take can be discovered, geotagged, and routed to a website that uh, your government is using to coordinate its response? What if we could hear about an event, go online, and be quickly routed to a forum where people are tracking the event, uh, tracking the status of a fire line, and helping to update uh, with current information or correcting out-of-date information? Well, we live in a world where those connections are being made. We live in a world where people local to an event can use the devices they carry to provide accurate and timely information. And we live in a world where we can reach through our devices and lend a helping hand to people who are in need. And that's a very exciting place to be. Thank you. <laughs>